In glancing over my notes of the seventy-odd cases in which I have, during the last eight years, studied the methods of my friend Sherlock Holmes, I find many tragic, some comic, a large number merely strange, but none commonplace. For, working as he did rather for the love of his art than for the acquirement of wealth, he refused to associate himself with any investigation which did not tend towards the unusual and even the fantastic. Of all these varied cases, however, I cannot recall any which presented more singular features than that which was associated with the well-known Surrey family of the Roylots of Stoke Moran. The events in question occurred in the early days of my association with Holmes, when we were sharing rooms as bachelors in Baker Street. It is possible that I could have placed them upon record before, but a promise of secrecy was made at the time, from which I have only been freed during the last month by the untimely death of the lady to whom the pledge was given. It is perhaps as well that the facts should now come to light, for I have reasons to know there are widespread rumours as to the death of Dr. Grimesby Roylott, which tend to make the matter even more terrible than the truth. It was early in April in the year 83 that I woke one morning to find Sherlock Holmes standing fully dressed by the side of my bed. Tea brewed, Mrs. Hudson. There's no tea out here, Watson. Mrs. Hudson has not yet lit the fires. Uh, what? Huh? Holmes? Uh, what the devil is uh... <coughs> You're not usually up this early, but what time is it? Quarter by seven, exactly. Very sorry to knock you up, Watson, but Mrs. Hudson has been woken. She has woken me, and I have woken you. Uh, well, what is it? A fire? No. Oh, no. no, my dear Watson, it is a client. It seems that a young lady has arrived in a considerable state of excitement who insists upon seeing me. She's waiting in the sitting room. Now, when young ladies wander about the metropolis at this hour of the morning and knock sleepy people up out of their bed, I presume that it is something very pressing which they have to communicate. Should it prove to be an interesting case, you would, I am sure, wish to follow it from the outset. I thought at any rate I should call you and give you the chance. Oh, my dear fellow, I would not miss it for anything. Then rouse yourself, sir, uh, and let us descend to the young lady, lady waitresses in the... I had no further that than in following hands in his, his professional investigation and in admiring the rapid deductions as swift as intuitions and yet, yet always founded on a logical basis, she unraveled the problem which was submitted to him. But I rapidly threw my clothes was, was ready in a few, few minutes to accompany my, my friend down to the sitting room. A lady, dressed in black and heavily veiled, who had been sitting in the window, rose as we entered. Good morning, madam. My name is Sherlock Holmes. This is my friend and associate, Dr. Watson, before whom you can kick free as before myself. Madam, I am glad to see that this is Hutter has had a good sense to light the fire. Pray, go on. Do it, and I shall you a cup of hot coffee, for I perceive you are shivering. It is not cold which makes me shiver. What then? It is fear, Mr. Holmes. It is terror. She raised her veil as she spoke and we could see that she was indeed in a pitiable state of agitation, her face all drawn and grey, with restless, frightened eyes like those of some hunted animal. Her features and figure were those of a woman of thirty, but her hair was shot with premature grey, and her expression was weary and haggard. Sherlock Holmes ran her over with one of his quick, all-comprehensive glances. You must not fear. We shall soon set matters right, I have no doubt. You have come in by train this morning, I see. You know me, then? No, but I observe the second half of a return ticket in the palm of your left glove. You must have started early, and yet you had a good drive in a dog cart along heavy roads. <laughs> there, there is no mystery, my dear madam. The left arm of your jacket is spattered with mud in no less than seven places. The marks are perfectly fresh. There is no vehicle save a dog cart which throws up mud in quite that way. And then, only when you sit on the left side of the driver. 
Whatever your reasons may be, you, you're perfectly correct. Oh, sir, I can stand this strain no longer. I, I, I shall go mad if it continues. I have no one to turn to. I, I heard of you, Mr. Holmes, from Mrs. Farintosh, whom you helped in the hour of her sore need. It was from her that I had your address. Oh, sir, perhaps you may help me too. I, I am unable to reward you for services at present, but... But in a month or two, I, I shall be married with control of my own income, and then at least you shall not find me ungrateful. Farintosh. Ah, yes, I recall the case. It was concerned with an opal tiara. I think it was before your time, Watson. Oh. I can only say, madam, that I shall be happy to devote the same care to your case as I did to your friends. But he doesn't even know what it's all about yet. Oh, Holmes. As to my reward... My profession is its own reward, but you are at liberty to defray whatever expenses I may be put to at the time which suits you best. And now I beg that you will lay before us everything that may help us in forming an opinion upon the matter. Mr. Holmes, the, the very horror of my situation lies in the fact that my fears are so vague and my suspicions depend so, so entirely on, on little things... Mr. Holmes, I have heard that you can see deeply into the manifold wickednesses of the human heart. Perhaps, perhaps you can help. I am all attention. My name is Helen Stoner. I live with my stepfather, who is the last survivor of one of the oldest Saxon families in England, the Roylets of Stoke Moran, on the western border of Surrey. Uh, the name is familiar to me. The family was, at one time, among the richest in England. A succession of dissolute and wasteful heirs squandered the family fortune. Nothing is left now save a few acres of ground and a 200-year-old house. My stepfather, the last of the line, escaped from this aristocratic poverty by dint of his own efforts. He took a medical degree and left for India, in Calcutta. There, through skill and force of character, he, he established a large practice. All went well, until until he was robbed. He suspected his butler and, in a fit of anger, beat the man to death. He narrowly escaped a capital sentence. As it was, he suffered a long term of imprisonment and then returned to England, a morose and disappointed man. He married my mother in India. She was the widow of Major General Stone of the Bengal Artillery and had a considerable private income, not less than a thousand a year, when she died, she bequeathed this money to Dr. Roylett. If either myself or my sister should marry, a certain sum should be given to us. It was about this time that we moved back to Stoke Moran. Mm -hmm. Once Mama had passed away, a terrible change came over our stepfather. Instead of making friends and exchanging visits with our neighbours, he shut himself up in the house, only venturing out to indulge in ferocious quarrels with whoever might cross his path violence of temper approaching to mania has been hereditary in the men of the family. In my stepfather's case, it had, I believe, been intensified by his long residence in the tropics. A series of disgraceful brawls took place, two of which ended in the police court, until at last he became the terror of the village. Damn you, scandalous! Oh, Dr. Royler, I, I didn't hear you coming. I'm a little deaf. Yes. Are you blind and lame before I finish with you? You damn near lamed my horse. By God, I'll thrash you, you imbecile. Oh, come here. Oh, please, sir. No, no! No, no sir. You know better than to stand in my way. I'll damn your spirit, sir. Into the river, will you? In you go. No, 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 sir. I beg you. Father! The man alone. What has he done? Dan Rascal tried to lame my horse. He needs to be taught a lesson. In you go. Oh, oh, please, Father, let him go. What? More insolence. I'll have you and your blasted sister in the street before I'm finished. Stand aside. Oh. There you are, sir. That'll improve your hearing and teach you to go dawdling in the road when there are horses at the gallop. Oh, Father. Father be damned. No, no, girl of mine. No, your sniveling half-wit of a sister. I'll not... Oh, 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 
goodness. Are you all right, Mr. Jones? What kind of damn fool question is that? I, I meant no offence. <sighs> can I get you a blanket or a cup of tea? Oh, you can get me a policeman. That's what you can do. Oh, I'll not stand for this. This is a public highway. He's no right. No right at all. I'll get some tea and a towel. <sighs> I won't be long. The gate lodge is only a little <sighs> down the road. <sighs> oh, Mr. Jones, please. Father is not well at present. He, he's constantly out of temper. Is there, is there anything we could do? Anything at all that might induce you to overlook this unfortunate incident? Well, I, I don't know as I ought to overlook anything. I've been taken a liberty with and I won't have it. I'll tell you that for free. Could, could I not offer a little sum by way of compensation? Oh, how little? Oh, um, well, shall we say 50 pounds? Fifty pounds, eh? Call it sixty, and I think I could forget this uh, unfortunate incident, eh? <laughs> I've got the tea and a towel. Oh, I'm... Julia. You must understand, Mr. Holmes. It was only by paying over all the money that I could gather together that I was able to avert another public scandal. Of course, Miss Turner, we understand. Uh, don't we, Watson? Absolutely, Holmes. Dr. Royal had had no friends at all, save the wandering gypsies. Sometimes he would wander away with them for weeks on end. He also has a passion for Indian animals. At the moment, he has a cheetah and a baboon, which wander freely over his grounds and are feared by the villagers almost as much as the master. Good Lord! Well, you can imagine from what I say that my poor sister and I had no great pleasure in our lives. No servant would stay with us and it proved impossible to look after so large a house. My sister was but 30 when she died, and yet her hair had already begun to whiten, even as mine had. Your sister is dead, then? She died just two years ago, and it is of her death that I wish to speak with you. Uh, please continue. You can understand that, living as we did, we saw very few people of our own age. One Christmas, we had the good fortune to visit our only aunt, Mrs. Honoria Westphail, and her son. They lived in Harrow. Julia was courted by the son, and very soon they were engaged to be married. Our stepfather offered no objection to the marriage, but, but within a fortnight of the wedding day, my sister was dead. Poor woman. This must be most distressing. Yet Holmes hasn't said a word. Just sits there with his eyes closed and his head sunk in a cushion. Pray be precise as to the detail. Every event of that dreadful time is seared into my memory. The manor house is, as I've already said, very old, and only one wing is now inhabited. The three bedrooms used by myself, my sister and Dr. Roylet open out onto the same corridor on the ground floor. The windows of the three rooms open out upon the lawn. That fatal night, Dr. Roylet had gone to his room early, though we knew he'd not retired to bed, for my sister was troubled by the smell of strong Indian cigars. Helen? Helen, are you awake? Yes. Come in, Julia. What's the matter? Nothing. I just can't sleep. Oh, is it the marriage? No, no, not at all. I just can't sleep. Might be Father's cigar smoke that wafts into my room. Oh, you should tell him it disturbs you, really, you should. And get my head bitten off for my trouble, no thanks. There's something else, isn't there? Yes. Tell me, Helen, have you ever heard anyone whistle in the dead of night? Never. I suppose that you could not possibly whistle yourself in your sleep? Certainly not. Why do you ask? Because during the last few nights, I have always, about three in the morning, heard a low, clear whistle. You know I am a light sleeper and it has always woken me up. I cannot tell where it comes from, perhaps from the next room, perhaps from the lawn. I just 
thought I would ask you whether you had heard it. No. No, I haven't. It must be the gypsies in the grounds. Possibly. And yet, if it were on the lawn, I wonder that you did not hear it also. Ah, but I sleep more heavily than you do. Well, it is of no great consequence at any rate. Good night. Good night, Julia. Turned away, and a few moments later, I heard her lock her bedroom door. Indeed. Was it your custom always to lock yourselves in at night? Always. And why? I think I mentioned to you that the doctor kept a cheetah and the baboon. We had no feeling of security unless our doors were locked. Mm, quite so. Uh, pray proceed with your statement. I could not sleep that night. A vague feeling of impending misfortune pressed in upon me. My sister and I, you will recall, were twins. And you know how subtle are the links which bind two souls which are so closely allied. It was a wild night. Wind was howling outside and the rain was beating and splashing against the windows. I'll see if I have a little brandy. Don't move. Oh, Julian. Julian, please. You'll be all right now. Right. Here's some brandy. This should revive the girl. Uh, help me hold her up. There. That's it. She's not drinking. She's not drinking any of it. I fear that your sister is dead. No. 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 <laughs> Such was the dreadful end of my beloved. Are you sure about this whistle and metallic sound? Could you swear to it? It is my strong impression that I heard it. And yet among the crash of the gale and the creaking of an old house, I may have been deceived. Was your sister dressed? No. She was already in her nightgown. In her right hand, I found the charred stump of a match. And in her left, a matchbox. Ah, that shows she'd struck a match and looked about her when the alarm took place. Very good, Watson. That could be very important. What conclusions did the coroner come to? He investigated the case with great care, for Dr. Roylott's conduct was notorious in the county. But he was unable to find any satisfactory cause of death. It was established that her room was totally secure. The windows were blocked by old-fashioned shutters with broad iron bars, which were made safe every night, and, and all the walls and the flooring were quite solid. It is certain, therefore, that my sister was quite alone when she met her death. Besides, there were no marks upon the body. Hmm. Holmes, uh, may I... Uh, by all means, my dear chap. How about poison? The doctors examined her for it, but without success. I see. Well, what do you think the unfortunate lady died of then? It is my belief that she died of pure fear. Though what frightened her, I cannot imagine. Were there gypsies in the grounds at the time? They are always there. Ah, and what did you gather from this allusion to the a band, a speckled band? It's 
Sometimes I've thought it was merely the, the wild talk of delirium. Sometimes that it may have referred to some band of people, perhaps to these very gypsies. I don't know whether the, the spotted handkerchiefs which so many of them wear over their heads might have suggested the strange words she used. These are deep waters. Uh, pray go on with your narrative. As I have said, this sad event took place two years ago and I have spent my time in loneliness and grief. A month ago, however, a dear friend, whom I've known for many years, has done me the honour of asking my hand in marriage. A Mr Percy Armitage of Cranewater, near Reading. My stepfather has offered no opposition to the match and all has been going well. Until two days ago, when I was forced to vacate my bedroom as repairs have been started in the west wing and the wall of my bedroom has been pierced, I have had to move into the same chamber where my sister died and to sleep in the very bed where she slept. Last night, as I lay awake thinking over her terrible fate, I suddenly heard, in the silence of the night, the low whistle, the same whistle that had heralded my sister's death. I sprang up and lit the lamp, but nothing was to be seen in the room. I dressed immediately, and as soon as it was daylight, I slipped out, took a dog cart to Leatherhead, and a train to London, resolved to seek your advice. You have done wisely. But have you told me all? Yes, all. Miss Turner, you have not. You are screening your stepfather. Why... What do you mean? Those marks on your wrist are the impress of a violent and vice-like grip. You have been cruelly used. Oh, I... He is a hard man, sir. Perhaps he hardly knows his own strength. Perhaps. This is a very deep business. There are a thousand details which I should desire to know before I decide upon our course of action. Yet we have not a moment to lose. If we were to come to Stoke Modern today, would it be possible for us to see over these rooms without the knowledge of your stepfather? Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. Today we have an opportunity. My stepfather is coming to town today on business. We have a housekeeper now, but she's old and foolish. I could easily get her out of the way. Excellent. You are not averse to this trip, Watson? By no means, Holmes. Then we shall both come. You may expect us early in the afternoon. Oh, I am in your debt, sir. I will await your arrival. Good day. Uh, Watson, would you mind showing Miss Turner to the door? Oh, it's quite all right. I can find my own way out. Thank you for your help. My heart is lightened already. What do you think of it all, Watson? It seems to me a most dark and sinister business. Mm. Dark and sinister enough. Yet if the lady is correct in saying that the flooring and walls are sound, and that all entries to the room were securely barred, then her sister must have undoubtedly been alone when she met her mysterious end. What becomes, then, of these nocturnal whistles? And what are the very peculiar words of the dying woman? I cannot think... When you combine the ideas of whistles in the night, the presence of a band of gypsies who are on intimate terms with this old doctor, the fact that the doctor has every financial reason for preventing his daughter's marriage, remember he stands to lose a large sum if either of his stepchildren marry, and finally the fact that Miss Stoner heard a metallic clang which could have been caused by one of those metal bars falling back into place, then I think the mystery may be cleared along these lines. I see. But what then did the gypsies do? I cannot imagine. I see many objections to any such theory. And so do I. It is precisely for that reason that we are going to Stoke Modern at once. I want to see whether any of these theories stand the light of day. The devil? A huge man framed himself in the doorway. His costume was a peculiar mixture of the professional and of the agricultural having a black top hat and a frock coat and a pair of high gaiters with a hunting crop swinging in his hand. 
So tall was he that his hat actually brushed the crossbar of the doorway, and his breadth seemed to span it across from side to side. A large face seared with a thousand wrinkles, burned yellow with the sun, and marked with every evil passion, was turned from one to the other of us, while his deep-set, bile-shot eyes and the high, thin, fleshless nose gave him somewhat the resemblance to a fierce old bird of prey. God! Which of you is Holmes? My name, sir, but you have the advantage of me. I am Dr. Grimesby Roylott of Stoke Moran. Indeed, Doctor. Pray take a seat. I will do nothing of the kind. My stepdaughter has been here. I have traced her. What has she been saying to you? Shall I stoke the fire? It is a little cold for the time of year. What has she been saying to you? But I've heard that the crocuses promise well. Is that not so, Watson? Uh, just so, Holmes. No, you put me off, do you? I know you, you scoundrel. I have heard of you before. You are Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, the Scotland Yard jack in office. Your conversation is most entertaining. When you go out, close the door, for there is a decided draught. I will go when I have had my say. Don't you dare to meddle with my affairs. I know Miss Toner has been here. I traced her. I am a dangerous man to fall foul of. <laughs> See here. <laughs> God, Holmes, he's bent the poker. There. Let that be a warning to you. I leave you this as a reminder of my visit. See that you keep yourself out of my camp. What an amiable chap. <laughs> I may not be quite so bulky, but if he had remained, I might have shown him that my grip was not much more feeble than his own. <sighs> Fancy is having the insolence to confuse me with the official detective force. <laughs> this incident gives zest to our investigation, however. Now, Watson, we must not dawdle, especially as old Roylott knows we are interesting ourselves in his affairs. So if you are ready, we shall call a cab and drive to Waterloo. Right, Holmes. Oh, Watson, I should be very much obliged if you would slip your revolver into your pocket. And Ely's number two is an excellent argument with gentlemen who can twist steel pokers into knots. That and a toothbrush are, I think, all that we need. Let's go. At Waterloo, we were fortunate in catching a train for Leatherhead, where we hired a trap at the station inn and drove for four or five miles through the lovely Surrey lanes. It was a perfect day, with a bright sun and a few fleecy clouds in the heavens. The trees and wayside hedges were just throwing out their first green shoots, and the air was full of the pleasant smell of the moist earth. To me, at least, there was a strange contrast between the sweet promise of the spring and this sinister quest upon which we were engaged. My companion sat in front of the trap, his arms folded, his hat pulled down over his eyes, and his chin sunk upon his breast, buried in the deepest thought. Suddenly, however, he started, halted the trap, tapped me on the shoulder, and pointed over the meadows. A countryman was walking with his dog, and Holmes strode over to greet him. My good man, would you be so kind as to tell us where we may find Stoke Modern House? You're right by there now, sir. Uh, there, on top of that hill. That's the house of Dr. Grimesby Roylett. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. We've come to take a look at the building work. Oh, yes. Yes. Well, we must be off. Uh, good day to you. Good day, sir. I thought it as well that this fellow should think we had come here as architects or on some definite business. It may stop his gossip. I don't like the look of the house, Holmes. Covered in dark ivy, stone crumbling, and the wings of the house like, like the claws of a crab. You have a very active imagination. Rare in a medical man. Uh, but an ornament in you, Watson. Ah, there's Miss Stoner. Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. Oh, thank goodness, I've been waiting so eagerly for you. All has turned out splendidly. Dr. Roylett has gone to town, and it's unlikely he'll be back before this evening. We have already had the pleasure of making the doctor's acquaintance. What do you mean? He called in on us soon after you had left. Uh, left me with a bent poker, uh, presumably in place of his calling card. Oh, good heavens! He must have followed me. So it would appear. 
What will he say when he returns? He must guard himself, for he may find that there is someone more cunning than himself upon his track. You must lock yourself away from him tonight. If he is violent, we shall take you away to your aunts at Harrow. Now we must make the best of our time, so kindly take us at once to the rooms which we are to examine. I see. Mm. The room was completely Ah, uh, yes. The room was completely secure. What is it, Holmes? The room was completely secure, and yet... Ah. What? Where does this bell ring? It goes to the housekeeper's room. It looks newer than the other things. Yes, it was only put there a couple of years ago. Your sister asked for it, I suppose. No, I never heard of her using it. We used always to get what we wanted for ourselves. Indeed. Uh, you will excuse me while I satisfy myself as to this floor. Uh, Dr. Watson, what is Mr. Holmes doing? He seems a little agitated. Not at all, my dear. Holmes has to get as close as he can to the very sinews of a crime. He may see something which no one else could possibly see. He's looking for a clue. Uh-huh. Uh hey, what is it, Holmes? It is a dummy. Hmm? The bell rope. It is a dummy. Won't it ring? No. It is not even attached to a wire. This is very interesting. You can see now... It is attached to a hook. Look, just above the opening at the ventilator. I never noticed that before. Very strange. There are one or two very singular points about this room. For example, why should a builder have opened a ventilator into another room? And with the same trouble, he might have communicated with the outside air. Very With your permission, Miss Turner, we shall now carry out our researches into Dr. Roylett's room. I say, quite a cavern of a room, and hardly a stick of furniture, a wooden bed, and... Is that a safe, Holmes? Miss Turner? Yes, it is a safe. And what is inside it? That father's business papers. Oh. You have seen inside it then? Only once, some years ago. I remembered it was full of papers. There isn't a cat in it, for example. A cat? No. What a strange idea. Well, look at this. Ah, I see. A saucer of milk. Yes, Watson. There are no cats, Mr. Holmes, except the cheetah. And there is also a baboon. Ah, yes. Of course. Well, uh, a cheetah is just a big cat, and yet a saucer of milk does not go very far in satisfying its wants, I dare say. Now, he look at this wicker chair. Huh. Just as I thought, that is quite settled. Right, I think we have seen enough. Hello. Here is something interesting. What do you make of that, Watson? Hmm? It's a common enough dog lash. But I don't know why the end should be tied in a loop. That is not quite so common. Is it? I mean, it's a wicked world, and when a clever man turns his brain to crime, it is the worst of all. I think we have now seen enough, Miss Stoner, and with your permission, we shall walk out upon the lawn. He is thinking, Miss Stoner, pondering and turning everything over in his mind. It's best not to disturb him. He'll speak when he's determined upon a course of action. I see. I've never seen Holmes's face so grim. His brows are knitted. Perhaps this case has confounded even his ability. Surely not. I must remain cheerful. 
Can't have poor Miss Stoner see that anything is amiss. Miss Stoner, it is essential that you should absolutely follow my advice in every respect. Of course, Mr. Holmes. The matter is too serious for any hesitation. Your life may depend upon your compliance. I assure you that I am in your hands. In the first place, both my friend and I must spend the night in your room. When your stepfather has gone to bed, you must signal to us with a lamp. And then you are to go immediately to the room you used to occupy. I have no doubt that in spite of the repairs, you could manage there for one night. Oh, yes, easily. Leave the rest to us. What will you do? We shall investigate the cause of this noise that has disturbed you. Mr. Holmes, I believe you already know the cause of my sister's death. Perhaps. Then for pity's sake, tell me. I should prefer to have clearer proof before I speak. You can at least tell me if my own thought is correct. Did she die of some sudden fright? No. I do not know. I think there was probably some more tangible cause. And now, Miss Turner, we must leave you. Time is short, and Dr. Roylott may return at any moment. Sherlock Holmes and I had no difficulty in engaging a bedroom and a sitting room at the Crown Inn. They were on the upper floor, and from our window we could command a view of the Avenue Gate and of the inhabited wing of Stoke Moore and Manor House. At dusk, we saw Dr. Grimesby Roylott drive past, his huge form looming up beside the little figure of the lad who drove him. The boy had some slight difficulty in undoing the heavy iron gates, and we heard the hoarse roar of the doctor's voice and saw the fury with which he shook his clenched fists at him. The trap drove on, and a few minutes later we saw a sudden light spring up among the trees as the lamp was lit in one of the sitting rooms in Stoke Moran. Holmes swung up the window seat in which he'd lounged and was already on the stairs. In a moment, we were out in the night air. It's very damp out here, Holmes. A little whiskey. No, thank you, Watson. Watson? Yes, Holmes? I was in two minds as to bringing you out with me tonight. There is a distinct element of danger. Can I be of assistance? Your presence might prove invaluable. Then, of course, I shall stay. It is very kind of you. You speak of danger. You've evidently seen more in those rooms than was visible to me. No, but I fancy I have deduced a little more. I imagine that you saw all I did. I saw nothing remarkable save the bell rope, and what purpose that could serve is a complete mystery. You saw the ventilator, too? Yes, but I do not think that such a thing is so unusual. It was so small a rat could hardly pass through. I knew we should find the ventilator before we came to Stoke Moran. Oh, my dear Holmes. Oh, yes, I did. You remember in her statement, she said that her sister could smell Dr. Roylott's cigar. That suggested at once that there must be a communication between the two rooms. I deduced a ventilator. But what harm could there be in that? Well, there is at least a curious coincidence of dates. A ventilator is made. A cord is hung and a girl who sleeps in the bed dies. Does not that strike you? I cannot as yet see the connection. Did you notice anything very peculiar about the bed? No. It was clamped to the floor. Did you ever see a bed fastened like that before? I cannot say that I have. The lady could not move her bed. It must always be in the same relative position to the ventilator and to the rope, for so we must call it, since it was clearly never meant for a bell pull. Holmes, I seem to see dimly what you're hitting at. We are only just in time to prevent some subtle and horrible crime. Subtle and horrible enough. When the doctor goes wrong, he is the first of He has nerve. And he has knowledge. Ah, look. Look there. Hmm? The signal. We must go. Steady your nerves, Watson, for we shall have horrors enough before the night is out. Did 
you see it? <laughs> it's a nice household. That was for the boom. Ah, uh, of course. There's a window. This turn has left it open. Right in the door. The least time would be fed to the You must stick it out right. You would see to the ventilator. Yes. Uh, one last thing. Do not go slow. Very light. May depend on it. I've got a pistol ready in case we should be. Mm -hmm. see something. It's pitch dark in here. No sound except that damn beast in the grounds. Oh, the light. He's back. Just the faintest gleam from the ventilator. He must have lit a dark lantern. And there's a smell. Burning oil. What's he doing in there? I must keep still. Listen. <laughs> Watson, take your pistol, and we shall enter Dr. Roylet's room. With a grave face, he lit the lamp and led the way down the corridor. Twice, he struck at the chamber door without any reply from within. Then, he turned the handle. And entered. I at his heels with the cocked pistol in my hand. It was a singular sight which met our eyes. On the table stood a dark lantern with the shutter half open, throwing a brilliant beam of light upon the iron safe, the door of which was ajar. Beside this table, on the wooden chair, sat Dr. Grimesby Roylott. Clad in a long grey dressing gown, his bare ankles protruding beneath, and his feet thrust into red, heelless, Turkish slippers. Across his lap lay the short stock with the long lash which we had noticed during the day. His chin was cocked upwards, and his eyes were fixed in a dreadful, rigid stare at the corner of the ceiling. Round his brow, he had a peculiar yellow band with brownish speckles which seemed to be bound tightly round his head. As we entered, he made neither sound nor motion. Oh, my God! Dr. Roylott! No, Watson, don't touch him. But what's that thing wrapped round his brow? The band. The speckled band. Look. It's moving. Devil, is it? It's a swamp adder, the deadliest snake in India. He has died within ten seconds of being bitten. Violence does in truth recoil upon the violent, and the schemer falls into the pit which he digs for another. Now the loop dog lash will prove its worth. Hand it to me, Watson. Oh. Let us thrust this creature back into its den, and then inform the police.
Yes, my dear Watson? Now that Miss Stoner is safely stowed with her aunt and the police have taken over, would you care to tell me how you were able to unravel this case? With pleasure, Watson, with pleasure. The combination of the dummy bell rope, the fixed bed, and the doctor's habit of importing creatures from India led me to the conclusion that he might use an animal to commit murder. And the only creature capable of using the bell rope as a bridge into the bedroom would be a snake. A snake's poison would be very difficult to detect. And it would be a sharp-eyed coroner indeed who could distinguish the two little dark punctures which would show where the poisoned fangs had done their work. Then I thought of the whistle. Of course, he must recall the snake before the morning. He had trained it, probably by the use of the milk which we saw, to return to him when summoned. He would put the snake through the ventilator, certain that he would crawl down the rope and land on the bed. It might or might not bite the occupant. Perhaps she might escape every night for a week, but sooner or later she must fall victim. When I attacked the snake, it slithered straight back through the ventilator and turned upon its master. Some of the blows from my cane must have roused its snakish temper so that it flew upon the first person it saw. In this way, I am no doubt indirectly responsible for Dr. Grimesby Roylott's death, and I cannot say that it is likely to weigh very heavily upon my conscience.